How to Overcome Anger. My name is Olu Shegun Moku Olu, and I'm your brother in Christ. And in this message, I'll be sharing on how to overcome anger. Uh, in the course of this message, I'll be looking at what exactly anger is, the danger of anger, why people get angry, what the Bible says about anger, anger rather, and how to overcome anger. And I will be addressing a question of getting angry and not falling into sin. Anger is one of the commonest sins with believers. You know, I believe that instead of defining what anger is, it is better described. When you take a bottle of water or a cup of water that has dirt in it and you place it and allow it to settle, after a while, the dirt goes down and you have what looks like a pure water. But if for any reason you shake that bottle of water or that cup of water, all the dead resurfaces and then the water becomes polluted and dirty. That is the way anger works. So you can see somebody who is very quiet, who is very happy, who is very lovely. But then all of a sudden the person manifests an aspect that you had not seen before. And you are wondering, how does this person behave like this? All along, anger has been in that person. Anger, the anger was only waiting for something to prompt it in order to come to the surface. Just like the shaking of that cup or that bottle of water brought about the death and the water becomes instantly dirty, in the same way, when people get provoked and they get angry, that's how they become dirty. That's how they become defiled in themselves. That's how they manifest anger. You know, some years ago, I used to have somebody and um, she appeared to be a very fantastic believer born again. She's quiet. She goes about her business. Very godly woman. She loves the Lord. Raising godly family. But then one day, an event happened in the compound where we live, and I've never seen her in that mood before. She got so angry, she said so many things, I couldn't just believe it. And it occurred to me, and I learned an important lesson that many believers never dealt with the issue of anger in their life. What they did. Or what they do is simply to avoid situations that could get them angry. So as if she knew she had an anger problem. So what she start, what she did was to avoid talking to people, was to avoid getting involved with people. So whereas we saw that as being minding her own business and quiet and easygoing, it was her own mechanism of keeping the anger away. But you see... If you take a bottle of water that has no dirt in it and the cup of water or the bottle is not dirty or no has impurity in it, no matter how much you shake it, no matter how much you shake it, the water will not get dirty. That is the plan of God, that no matter how much we are provoked, we don't get angry. Is this possible? And does, this, does the scripture actually teaches this? You know, so when people get angry, you see that they raise their voice. Even in homes, between husband and wife, they can talk sweet to each other, but as soon as anger sets in, they change the tone with which they speak with each other. They may not agree that they are angry, but the fact remains that anger is now in operation. So when people are angry, they raise their voice. They say things that they ought not to say. They mostly say things that they regret later. Things that ordinarily they would not have said. People say things like that when they are angry. Anger can even lead to death. People can kill 
another person out of anger. We have had cases where husband will kill wife out of anger or wife will kill husband out of anger. So anger is extremely destructive. People can develop hatred for another person because of anger, even malice. You know, when you are angry with someone, you don't want to talk with that person. When you are angry at someone, you, do, you may likely hate that person. Parents may operate in anger and call it discipline. You know, many, often when, when parents discipline their children, many do it out of anger, not out of understanding. They beat their children because they are angry, not because they want to correct them. They beat them because of the way they feel, not because they want to train the children. But they will not agree that it is anger. That's how many abuse children and beat them recklessly. Whereas the scripture talks about the rod of correction. It didn't say the rod of anger. So as parents or in the home, anger can manifest. And you think that what you are doing is discipline. And it can even, this can translate to the place of work, can translate to the larger society. Where you begin to make punishment out to people. And you call it discipline. Whereas what is actually going on in your heart is anger. You know, anger also makes people to do shameful things. You do things that later you are ashamed that how did I do this? I've seen people who will fight publicly. You know, some will remove their clothes. You have probably seen videos of of women who are fighting in the street, who will remove their clothes, who will tear each other's clothes and beat each other. Unfortunately, we live in a world filled with lots of bad people that rather than separate them and not allow them to fight, they rather bring out their phone to record them. It usually amazes me how people could degenerate sad low that you see two women fighting, no matter the cause of the fight, that you can't step in and separate them, but you are filming it. The Bible says, Blessed are the peacemaker, for they shall be called the sons of God. So people do shameful things because of anger. So now you have an an idea of what an anger is. Anger, you can get angry without even saying a word or without even reacting. You can sit quietly and be filled with anger. Often we confuse rot with anger. Rot is when you put an action into it. Rot is when you threaten, when you, when you, when you physically erupt. It's almost like a volcano. You know, when a volcano physically erupts and you are no longer in control of yourself. You know, but anger can, is, can be a feeling that you can even sit down quietly and you are greatly angry at somebody and you are holding your mouth. You are not doing anything, but you are angry. And so you can operate silently. You can deal with someone silently out of anger and nobody will even know that you are angry. And yet you are angry. This is what happened in the mafia world. They are so angry, but they've mastered how to keep themselves calm. And then exact vengeance when the person is not even expecting it. You know, so these are, this is just to describe to all some of the attributes of anger. Now, what are the dangers of anger? Number one, anger can keep you from entering the kingdom of God. If you read Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 to 20, he said the works of the flesh are manifest, which are this. And then he listed them. Anger is one of them. And he concluded by saying, I warn you as I've warned you before, that they that live like this shall not inherit the kingdom of God. I think that is the greatest danger. Anything that can keep you from entering the kingdom of God, anything that can keep you from reigning with Jesus in eternity is a serious problem and you must give it priority attention in your life. It's not something you must sweep under the carpet. Anger is very destructive. I remember in, in, in my days in secondary school or what is called high school in some climb. There's this particular colleague of mine that I don't love relating with at all. The reason is because at any little thing he gets angry. 
And when he gets angry, he gets very violent. And so everybody tries to avoid such a person. And there are people like that who are so engulfed with anger that at the slightest provocation, they can destroy and do very terrible things. Anger destroys your Christian testimony. Anger destroys your Christian testimony. You know, a brother once said it in a very comical way. Terrible but comical. You know, he was sent to a bank some years ago. You know, we were learning to be like Jesus. And we were in this group. We were learning how to overcome the flesh and walk in the spirit and so on. And so many of us were walking that way. And we thought that's how everybody is up, was operating. Now, this brother was sent to a bank one day and somebody got on his heart, nerves in the bank. And he, he used to be one of the finest brothers amongst us. And so he got angry and um, he said many things and was ready to fight and they were holding him back. So when he got back, he told me, he said, you won't believe what happened today. I said, what happened? He said, the old man was revealed. <laughs> you know, because the old man is our sinful nature. So he was using our terminology. He said the old man was revealed. I said, how? And he explained how he got hungry at the bank. And I was so shocked because as at that time, I didn't think that a believer would behave like that. I was like, why would you do that? Why would you get angry and we were ready to fight despite everything that we have been learning? So anger destroys your Christian testimony. You cannot get angry like that and then the next time you carry a Bible or you carry a tract or you are talking to people about Jesus or you are talking to them about God. So anger is very dis destructive. Uh, anger also do irreparable damage. Anger can make somebody to do irreparable damage either on somebody or on themselves. Did you know that there are a lot of people in prisons today just because of anger? A lot of people in our correctional centers, in jail, just because of anger. You know, when I watch crime programs and I see how people, somebody out of a moment of anger will kill someone only to be sentenced to life imprisonment without parole or to be put on death row. So you can see how dangerous anger is. There's just one moment of foolishness, of rage, and that is the end. Then the person spends the rest of his or her life in prison or waits on death row. Or some, or some people get executed just because of anger. And, you know, when I think about it, I'm like, so if somebody had met this person and had helped him and show him way of overcoming this anger this person would not have lived the rest of his life in prison. So that's why I say that anger does irreparable damage or damages to the life of people. Anger also destroys relationship. Anger destroys relationship. I had to pull a brother some time ago from another person when they were engaging in, in, in foul utterances and words and they were going to fight and so and I had to pull this brother away and I told him, I said, don't you realize that you and this person will not greet each other tomorrow and that is malice. What happens if you die before that time? You know? So it destroys our Christian testimony. It destroys relationship. You are not free to relate with each other again. That's why it easily leads to malice. You know, when the Bible said, uh, be angry and sin not, it's because it easily leads to all of these other sin. Anger can lead to murder, can lead to envy, can lead to malice. It can lead to all manner of things. Anger. In fact, it can lead to ambition. Just because we are angry that somebody did something, and so you want to pay that person, or you want to show that person. And so you, you embark on this journey of personal ambition to achieve something. So you've got to be careful uh, about anger. Now, why do people get angry? Why do we get angry? We get angry because it is in our nature. What do I mean by this? You see, when Adam fell in the garden, a lot of things were destroyed. 
we mankind inherited or took in the nature of Satan, which is often called the Adamic nature or self of the old man or flesh. Man took on this nature because man had given up the nature, the likeness of God, and had exchanged it for becoming like God. You know, God made them in his own image, but Satan said to them, you will become like God. Essentially, Satan gave them his own nature. So every man from Adam is born in sin. If you give birth to a child tomorrow, that child will be born in sin. Everybody is born in sin. So this very satanic nature became the gene that is now being passed from man to man and from generations to generation. So that's why anger is one of the manifestations of the flesh. Just like you have adultery, you have fornication, lavishness, hatred, envy, drunkenness, and so on. Is the Anger is also in the same category. It's one of the manifestations of the flesh. It is not a spirit. You know, people talk about the spirit of anger. It's not a spirit. It is just of the flesh. That's why you will never see anywhere in the Bible where they were casting any demons out so that that person can be free from the spirit of anger. There's nothing like the spirit of anger. Anger is a manifestation of the flesh. Not that there's no spirit of um, adultery or fornication. They are all manifestations of the flesh. So it's a manifestation of the flesh. It's of the sinful nature. And like I describe it, it's always there in every human being that is born of a woman. Until, But it doesn't show until somebody provoke it out of you. So when you see everybody on a good day, we are all good, nice, quiet, loving people. But once you provoke and everybody have their own threshold, you know, what is just like uh, boiling water. It's 100 degree. But you see, when it comes to anger, some people boil at 2 degree. Some people boil at 45 degree. Some boil at 90 degree. Some boil at 10 degrees. So the degree of Things that provoke people to anger varies from person to person. But anger is in every human being born of a woman. Anger is just right there. But it is quiet like a water that is settled. So when you look at the water, it appears clean. But when you shake the water, you will see all the dead, uh, all the dead coming out. That's why some people are surprised at themselves. When they get angry, they're like, they couldn't even believe they could get this angry or they regret it later. Some don't even know the level of anger that is that is within them. And you see, anger has various degrees, but anger in the final analysis is anger. All right. Anger in the final analysis is anger. It does not matter the degree of your anger. It's just like sin. Sin is sin. Um, God doesn't weigh sin. Yeah, it does, it's either a sin or it's not a sin. It does not matter the quantity. So anger is anger. Whether it is much, it is mild, it is small. It is still anger and it is of the sinful nature. And of this nature, no one can inherit the kingdom of God. Why do you get angry? Because you do not know the gravity. You don't know the gravity. That's one of the reason, reasons why we get angry. We don't know that uh, it could lead, what it could lead to and how it destroys our testimony and what happens in the spirit realm. We don't know, unlike um, fornication, adultery, you know, a, a, a godly Christian woman or man, for example, will feel bad if he ever falls into adultery or fornication and so on. But how often do people feel bad when they get angry? How often do people feel the way they feel when they fall into other sin? Do they feel that way when they get angry? It's because they don't also know the gravity that anger carries, just like with every other sin. 
if people are convinced that this is a sin that can keep them from the kingdom of life, then they will take the matter more serious uh, before the Lord. Now, it could also be that you don't listen to the Holy Spirit. Because, I'm saying this because the Holy Spirit keeps us from certain situations. But if you disobey Him, you will fall into that situation. There are times when you are talking and the Holy Spirit is saying, it's enough, keep quiet, hold your peace. But you go ahead, you keep talking. And that talk will eventually lead to something that provokes you, and then you get angry. If you had listened to the Holy Spirit and you are taking caution at that moment, you will have avoided it. Or if you have allowed the Holy Spirit to guide you, maybe you are going in this direction and the Holy Spirit said, no, go in this other direction. So when you disobey the Holy Spirit, it brings you into a situation that you may not have grace for. You know, Jesus said, uh, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. It means that when you deliberately put yourself in a, in a situation where you can commit sin, you may not find grace to help you. But if it's a situation where it's of your no, it's not of your making, you just find, you find yourself there, then the Holy Spirit will provide grace for you. But if you go deliberately and say, I want to commit sin, and then you are now looking for grace not to commit sin, you are just deceiving yourself. So when you don't listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit, it could lead you to anger. So what are some of the things that the Bible has said about anger? We cannot look at all of it, but we just examine a few. The reason why we are laying this background without just jumping into how to overcome anger is to help us have an holistic understanding of exactly what anger is. Now, in the book of Numbers chapter 20, uh, particularly verse 11, you will read the story of Moses, how he got angry. And for that alone, because he did not honor the Lord, he did not hallow the name of the Lord before the people. God said, you are not going to lead them into this land. You've only brought them out of Egypt, but you are not taking them to the promised land. So if a man as meek as Moses, because there was a testimony that he was the meekest man on earth, a man that is that meek, if he could get angry and miss it, then we need to learn important lesson from his life. That anger can keep a man from the plan of God for his life. Even on the pulpit, there are ministers that are demonstrating anger on the pulpit and they think they are preaching. Some of them have had something said about them. And so they will come on pulpit and begin to preach about how people gossip about man of God. You see, he's only trying to um, manifest his anger or express his anger, but disguised now as a message. Many will come and begin to cause. I've seen a pastor who was saying that anybody that is speaking against the pastor of this church or backbiting against this church, may they be caused with leprosy and so on. You see, he had had things being said and he got angry and is now manifesting that anger on the pulpit. I've had cases of a, a minister of God slapping people on, pulpit, on the pulpit. You know, it is not ministry. It is anger. It is you that have problem. And we must be careful. When Moses got angry and he, he uh, uh, struck the, the rock, water still came out. You see, God still backed him up. But his character had failed God. It's possible that our character fails the Lord, yet God in his infinite mercy still manifests his gift and power through us. We must not convince that or use that to think that our life is right with God. So be very careful. People, and as believers, we need to watch this, that we do not manifest anger, even in the place of prayer. Some are, some are manifesting anger in the place of prayer. Somebody had provoked you, you are angry. 
when you get to the place of prayer, that's what you have start praying about. Oh Lord, all these people that speak evil of people everywhere, Father, shut their mouth. You see, it is anger. That's not a correct prayer. You are praying out of anger. You are not praying by revelation. You are not praying by knowledge. You are praying out of anger. That is the lesson we must all learn from the story of, of Moses. Then we also have David in 1 Samuel chapter 25. When David sent his men to take food from neighbor, and this man refused and said, Who is David that I will honor him? And David got angry. And David said that he was going to kill every male person in that family, starting from neighbor. Until when Abigail, a woman of wisdom, had to quickly put some things together and met David on the way. And pleaded with David that David should not commit sin because somebody had provoked him. I think we need to learn from that lesson. In verse 22 of 1 Samuel chapter 25, David said, May God do so, and more also to the enemies of David, if I leave one male of all who belong to him by morning light. Can you see? David was even swearing by God. People will be expressing anger in the name of God. He was going, just because a man refused to give him bread, he was going to kill everybody. That's anger. Anger is foolish. Uh, anger will make a man to do foolish things, unreasonable things. In fact, I usually joke that when people are angry, they are temporarily mad. Because it's like their senses is suspended. And if you notice, it's like something had taken over when people get angry. Just because neighbor refuses to give David bread, he was going to kill everybody in his family. But thank God for a wise woman like Abigail, who said to David, let me read what she said from uh, verse 26. It says, Now therefore, my Lord, as the Lord lives and as your soul lives, since the Lord has held you back from coming to bloodshed and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now then let your enemies and those who seek harm for my Lord be as neighbor. Be she pleaded with David. And David eventually said, All right, I'm going to withhold my hand. Otherwise, if not for Abigail, we will not be talking about David killing only Uriah alone. We'll be talking about David killing neighbor and every male of his family. And God may have actually withdrawn the kingdom from David. Who knows? God may have withdrawn it from him if he had killed many innocent people uh, like that. So that is what anger does. And remember, David said, may God do so to me. <laughs> he was even putting God in it and it was just anger. Then we have other scriptures that uh, says different things about anger that is important we examine them. In Psalm 37 verse 8, the scriptures say, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. We say, cease from anger. That means that detach yourself completely from anger. In Proverbs 15, 1, it says, A soft answer turneth away wrath, but grievous words stirs up anger. Grievous words. You know, so the devil knows this, that grievous words stirs up anger. So you know what the devil does? The devil raises people around you to speak grievous words to you. If you are not sensitive in the spirit, if you are not discerning, you will hear those words and then you will get angry. You will hear, the devil will ensure that the things that people said behind you, you will hear it. It's deliberate. People will speak behind you and Satan himself will ensure that what people have said behind you, you hear it. And it becomes grievous. And then it stirs up anger in you. I'm still going to dwell on this when I come to how to overcome anger. But it is good that we, we learn from the words of the scripture. Uh, Proverbs 
16.32 says, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh a city. You see, people who get angry, when, or let me say when people are angry, they are no longer in control of their spirit. That's what happens. It's like a man that is drunk. He's no longer in control of the things he's saying. He's no longer in control of his action. Even though nobody is holding him, he already has something in him. That's the way anger operates. When you are angry, you are not in control. And God is act- for you to see the weight of this issue of anger. The Bible says that the person that is slow to anger is better than the mighty. In other words, you are who who are the mighty men in our society today? Let's take, for example, the president of US, the president of Russia, the president of China, uh, maybe the chancellor of um, Germany, you know, all, all those kind of men. But the scripture is saying that, see, you are greater than them if you are slow to anger. You are greater than all those men if you are slow to anger. Because you are in, you are the one that is ruling your spirit. Says so you are better than a warrior who can take an entire city. The person that can rule his own spirit is better than the person that can rule a whole continent. He is better than a world leader. Somebody who can rule his own spirit is better than a world leader. In Ecclesiastes chapter 7 verse 9, the scripture says, Be not hasty in thy spirit to be hungry, for anger rested in the bosom of fools. How do you know a fool? A fool get angry. <laughs> a foolish person gets angry. Say, anger dwells in their bosom. So they are quick to get angry because they have it in abundance. They are close relatives. They live together. They dwell together with anger. Anger is in their bosom. That means it's in their hearts. With, with the slightest provocation, they get angry. And God says, that's a foolish man. When you see somebody who gets angry like that, that's a foolish man. Proverbs fourteen seventeen says, He that is soon angry, dealeth foolishly. And a man of wicked devices is hated. He that is soon angry. That means that when you are somebody that quickly gets angry, you are going to make mistakes. You are going to do foolish things. Did you know that I've seen women that get angry because their husband was involved in adultery and out of anger, they also go to just go and sleep with somebody. Only to now feel used, to feel dirty, to feel empty in the end. The man had sinned. And if you know the consequence of adultery, you will actually pity that matter. <laughs> because adultery is not a small matter in the eye of God. So why would you get so angry? To now say what you will now do is to go and sleep with other people. People commit adultery out of anger. Adultery out of anger just because my spouse has betrayed me. Oh, I, I want to go and do it also. That's why the Bible says that when you are angry, you do foolishly. That's Proverbs 14, 17. You do foolishly. Then we have this in Proverbs 21, 19 that says, It is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Can you see? Do you know what a wilderness is? You know, because we are, we are advanced today, we have developed most places, we have parks and so on, we don't really understand what a wilderness is. A wilderness is a deserted place, both by human and even by nature. It's not a place that is friendly to animals. It's not a place that is friendly to man. It's not a place any human being wants to dwell. The weather, the climate of, a, of wilderness is not conducive for living. It's like a place where somebody can be dumped to just die. Now, how can anybody live there? And do you know the kind of animals you have there? Mostly snakes. And the Bible is saying it's better you live in that kind of a place than to marry an angry woman. And so in my marriage class, when I teach young people about marriage and we talk about those you should not marry, I usually emphasize this. You don't need to pray 
Once the person you meet is an angry person, you can't marry that person. Because you see, if you look at the follow-up scripture, which is Proverbs 22, 24, it says, Make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go. Thou shalt not go. Don't marry a man that is angry. You don't need prayer anymore. You don't need any other thing. You don't need to consider his proposal. Any man and woman who are, who are given to anger, they are not your choice for marriage. God has said that already. So when you go into those kind of marriages, it's what you get there. You must be ready for the consequence. People have died because they marry an angry man. Women have died because they married angry men. Men have died because they married angry women. You have to be careful. So it is to tell you how terrible it is when people get angry or people that get angry, how terrible they are. In Colossians uh, 2, no, Colossians chapter 3 verse 21, the scripture says, Father, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. You know, I mentioned this earlier, that many parents, when they are disciplining their children, it's not out of love, it's not out of understanding, it's not out of training or correction, it's because they are angry. So God knows this, and that's why God is saying, don't provoke your children to anger. Don't provoke them to anger. Parents need to be careful not to provoke their children uh, to anger. And then in Titus Chapter 1, verse 7 says, For a bishop must be blameless, as steward of God, not self will, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, not given to fill the locker. That means, you know, the emphasis is not soon angry. A genuine man of God cannot be somebody that gets angry. But today you see anger all over our pulpit. All over. You will see men of God come and cause people, cause this. Once something happens, they cause, they cause them. As a servant of God, somebody had abused you or has said something to you. It is not for you to manage your reputation. It is God's business to manage your reputation. It is your business to be faithful preaching his word. You just go and preach his word. Leave it. But you see many men of God today, they come and use the pulpit to release their anger. And they disguise it as if it's a message. They disguise it as if they are doing godly things. Anyone that will truly be a servant of God must not be somebody that gets angry. Now, so that leads us to the question because we've now examined some of the teachings of the scripture concerning uh, anger. And that leads to the question, how then do we overcome anger? What do you need to do to overcome anger? Number one, and that is the only one thing, you need Jesus. Finish. All you need to overcome anger is Jesus Christ. If you can understand this, I wouldn't need to go further than this. But because many may not understand this, I'm going to break it down into parts. What I'm doing is not to give you formula or high point on how to overcome anger. What I'm doing is to just break it down, the, what the, the Lord Jesus has done for us. You see, Jesus came and took care of all our sins. The same way he came to deal with adultery, fornication, and so on, that's the same way he has dealt with anger. But we are going to break it down so that we can have a clearer understanding. So the point I'm giving is just to break that understanding of what Jesus had done down. Number one is that you must become born again. You cannot overcome the flesh except you are born again. We have established that anger is one of the manifestations of the flesh. Galatians chapter 5 verses 19 and 20. And the conclusion is that those who live like that cannot inherit the kingdom of God. And guess what? Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. Except a man be born again, he cannot inherit the kingdom of God. It's the same thing. 
To overcome the flesh, you must become born again. How do you become born again? Two, it, it has two parts to it. There is the act of God and there is the decision of man. It's only God who can burn you again. What happens when you're born again is that you become regenerated. That Adamic life, that sinful nature that we have all inherited from Adam, that satanic nature, the life of iniquity is terminated when you give your life to Jesus. Because Jesus has already paid that price on the cross of Calvary. So when you become born again, that, that is an act of God. Your spirit is resurrected. You can now begin to fellowship and commune with the Holy Spirit. You become a new creation. So the first step is that you must become born again. Now, but there is an, a, your own part to it, which is that you must acknowledge what Jesus has done for you. You must repent of your sin. You must come to say, Lord, help me. You see, many people struggle with sin because they are still trying to impress God. God has not called you to impress him. God knows that you are full of anger. You are full of sin. You are full of unrighteousness. And that is why he sent his son Jesus to die for you. So there's no need to impress God. So why not go before God and say, God, I am struggling with anger. Have mercy on me, O Lord. But you know, we don't want to cry to God like that. We are now trying to go before him and pretend as if we are even good. None of us is good. They call Jesus good. They said nobody is good except the Father in heaven. If Jesus said that, who are you to think you are good? So you must become born again. Repent of your sin. Confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Accept him into your life and receive the Holy Spirit. Actually, if you don't receive the Holy Spirit, you will still struggle. So you must receive the Holy Spirit. How do you receive the Holy Spirit? You can receive the Holy Spirit privately in your room. You can simply ask the Lord and say, Father, I want to receive the Holy Spirit. And believe that you have received it. And he will come to you. Somebody can pray for you to receive the Holy Spirit. Like we saw in the book of Acts. Peter prayed. In fact, there was a time when Peter was preaching and the Holy Spirit came. So the Holy Spirit will come upon you. So when you become born again, when you confess your sin, when you confess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, when you say, as from today, I want to follow you, I want to deny myself, I want to pick up my cross and follow you daily. When you do that, you become born again. When you do that from your heart, and then you ask for the Holy Spirit, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. Also, you must now have knowledge of what Jesus had done, of what your salvation entails. If, for example, you read um, Romans chapter 6, the book of Romans uh, chapter 6, it explains how we are no longer to live in sin. In Romans 6, verse 6 says, knowing this, it means there are things you must now know. You need to know what I'm about to read to you. Knowing this, that our old man, that old man that gets angry, that commits fornication, adultery, that tells lies, hatred, jealousy, envy, rot, laviciousness, selfish ambition, that wicked old nature. He says, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him. If God would open your eyes to understand this, you will live victorious over anger forever. You see that anger you are struggling with, I have a good news for you, had been nailed to the cross. You know, some of you may say, okay, if it had been nailed to the cross, why am I still suffering with it? It's because you don't know it. You have to know it, and then you have to do something which I'm still going to read to you. That he has been crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. Not that sin might be going gradually. He said that the body of sin might be done away with. The sinful nature might be completely removed from you. You know, I remember when I gave my life to Christ. And after six months of intensive care, in the hand of God, you know, there was a national strike back then in our university or, or college, and I had to be 
in the house and I spent time with the scriptures, read a lot of books, spent time to pray. And after six months, they called off the strike and I had to go back to school. Then I remember vividly, this should be about 19 years ago, somebody told me something about someone. And I just said, in my, I just said, that person must be stupid. And immediately I had a sharp rebuke in my spirit. That was the last day I got angry and said somebody was stupid. That was the last day in my life. I now realize that it was the new life of Jesus that is inside of me. The sinful life had gone. That's the life that gets angry and say all those kind of words. But that life had gone. I couldn't just say it any longer. It wasn't my effort. It wasn't that I tried to remind myself and say, Shegun, you must not get angry. Shegun, you must not get angry. That wasn't the case. You know, some people do that. They try to keep reminding themselves that they must not get angry. And then they end up getting angry. So it says that we should no longer be slaves to sin. We were once slaves to sin. The reason you couldn't overcome anger all along is because you are a slave to anger. And because you are a slave, anytime anger needs you to work, you will work for him because you are a slave. But Jesus Christ, the Bible is teaching us now that Jesus had actually died and nailed that sinful nature so that you are now free from anger. You must know it. You must believe it. Don't first of all ask yourself that, oh, how will this work? Will I not get angry tomorrow? That's not what is important now. What is important is that know it for a fact. If God said, I've crucified your flesh, believe it. Don't look at yourself. You are not the one that proves the word of God. The word of God is already proven. So it's not you that is coming to prove it. So believe what he has said concerning you. Believe that anger had been nailed to the cross. Each time you see any picture or image on the, of the cross, always remember that your anger was nailed to that cross. Then there's something you now have to do because of this knowledge. In verse 11, it now says, Likewise, you also reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin. Nobody can do this for you. Believe it that you are dead to sin. Don't say, well, but I'm sick. No, 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 no. See, this is what the word of God says. God is he who caused the things that are not as if they were. You have to first of all bear the name Abraham, father of many nations, before you will have a single child. What God was showing to us through that name change is that we must first of all believe what he has said about us before we see it manifest. So you don't wait for it to manifest before you believe. Some people are waiting to overcome anger before they believe that their anger is dead. You will, they will never overcome it. But the day you believe truly in your heart that anger has been nailed to the cross and you reckon yourself to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God. You are indeed dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus our Lord. So you must reckon yourself to be dead to anger. You must believe that you are dead to anger because that is actually your reality. And you will only experience the power of God when you believe it. You see, the children of Israel, they had to pass through two seas, Red Sea and River Jordan. Resi, Moses just stretched forth his rod and they passed through. But when he came to River Jordan, they have to exercise their faith. So until they stepped into the water, the water didn't part. There was no rod to part it, but their faith. That is what happened. You see, initially, you just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you are saved. Now for you to walk in it and begin to experience the life of Jesus and walk victorious over all these sins, you must exercise your faith. You need to believe it that you are dead to sin. You are dead to anger. Even when you have not seen the victory, you need to believe it. And nothing must ever shake that belief forever. I want to tell you, when you believe it like that, the power of God, the power of resurrection is released into your life to be victorious over sin, over lust, over anger, over any kind of sin. Number three, you must understand the gravity. See, many times people, people treat something uh, with kid glove because they do not know the gravity of what they, were, they are doing. Remember, 
David, when he sinned, and everything had settled, Uriah had been killed, and God sent a prophet to him. When they told David what he had done, he said, I have sinned against God. And God says, I have forgiven you. But because you allowed the enemy to blaspheme, hmm, in the spirit realm, David made it possible for Satan to mock God. But do you know that even though for David, that, was, that happened only once, for many of us, it is on many occasions. That's why it's a foolish message when people say that David was a terrible sinner. He wasn't a terrible sinner. God himself said that the only time he had issue with David was on the issue of uh, Uriah. But many of us, if God is going to count the number of times he has issue with us, it's uncountless. How then do people describe David as a war sinner? He wasn't. I would even prefer to have his record. A man that sinned only once. At least to God, that's what God recorded against him. But if God will record my own sin, I'm sure he will not have enough or sufficient book to record all of that. Thank God for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you must know the gravity that when you do these things, you destroy your Christian testimony. You destroy your life. It also shows that you are not growing in Christ and you are not yet ready to be used correctly of God. Because if God places anything tangible in your hand, anger will destroy it. All right? And then we have scriptures like Ephesians 4.31, which we now understand. It says, Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, and clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Why did he say be put away from you? Because you are now dead to it. So you just have to put them away. What are you putting away? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, evil speaking. You can find that in Ephesians chapter 4 verse 31. And if you look at Colossians 3, 8, it says, But now ye also put off all this. What are the things you should put off? Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communications out of your mouth. You must pull all of these things out of your mouth. How do you do it? Because you are dead to sin. So you just say, no, I, I, I can't get angry at this. No, I can't keep malice. And so if you don't want to greet, have malice, that means you greet somebody, you talk to that person. If you don't want to get angry, you love that person. You can now do it because you now have the grace. The Bible said the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Teaching us to say no to every ungodliness. You now have grace to say no. And um, you must also renew your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. This is very critical because one of the reasons people get angry is their mindset. Is their mindset. You see, you process information. The way you process information determines whether you get angry or not. I've seen things that people get angry at not make, making any meaning to me. I've seen people that the things that they are ready to kill another person for, somebody else does not even count it to be anything. It's because of the way that person programs his mind. So when they were nailing Jesus to the cross, should he not have been angry? Should he not have been angry? You've never done anything wrong in your life. Even the, the judge says, he is not guilty, but I condemn him to death. Only Jesus has re received such a ten sentence in history that he was not guilty, but he was sentenced to death. He should be angry. They were nailing him. Can you imagine somebody nailing me, breaking my bones, blood flowing out? Can you see that wickedness that they would naked me and beat me publicly? It's such will be painful. How will I not get angry? But look at what Jesus said. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. Why did Jesus say that? Because he understood the nature of man. That those people, they were acting that way because they were under the influence of Satan. Satan now said, he said, if he had known, he would not have crucified the king of glory. But where was Satan when all of that was being done? Even Judas was deceived by Satan. The Bible says Satan entered into the heart of Judas. So Jesus processed the information differently. He understood that these people, if they had known something different, they would never have acted this way. So he said, Father, forgive them, 
for they know not what they do. You must have that. You see, I expect people to backbite me. I expect people to stab me at the back. In fact, at times I say to myself that unbelievers surprises me, uh, surprise me when they don't do certain things because I expect it. What else do you expect from a non-believer? Or what else do you expect from people? The Bible has said that we must endure with one another. I want to tell you, why must we endure with one another? It means we will be doing things to each other. And that's believers. I'm not even talking of unbelievers now. That's between believers. It means that we will be doing things to each other that we won't like. And we must endure it with one another. So I'm, I'm, I, you must have in mind, prepare that brethren will offend you. Brethren will betray you. You must understand that. And it's a result of the weakness in their own life. So why will you get angry? Rather, that person needs help. That's why your mind has to be renewed so that you process information differently. Somebody says, I'm stupid. It is that person's opinion. Everybody is entitled to his or own opinion. He believes I'm stupid. God said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. God said, I'm so worthy that he, would die for, he died for me. So why will, will I be angry at somebody else's stupid opinion? Why? There's no need. There's no need to be angry. You know, that's why I'm amazed. You know, when black people are playing football, as some white people will hold banana. And then that black person, footballer, will say, oh, he's being abused. This is racial abuse. Please, how is banana a racial abuse? Banana is a food. I will, I will eat it. But why do you get angry? Because you've processed it that they are saying that you are a monkey. They are not saying you are a monkey. They only raise banana and then you are getting angry. And even if they say that you are a monkey, why would you be angry at somebody who is confused? Somebody who does not know the difference between a human being and a monkey. Why are you angry at that person? You should pray for that person that God will give that person sanity of mind so that that person can know the difference between monkey and human being. And so you don't need to walk. You don't need to, to, to worry or anything. You know, I was speaking to a, a lady in America the other time and I just mentioned the word nigger and she was like, no, 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 no. It's offensive if you say it and so. But you see, back here in Nigeria, you know, when we want to play and joke within ourselves, we call ourselves nigger. You know, I'm like, oh, you know, ah, my brother, you know, I'm a, I'm a big nigger now. In fact, we won't say things like, I'm a nigger for Jesus. For us, nigger means nothing. It doesn't mean anything. Over there, they've processed it wrongly. They feel that, oh, it means something. It means somebody must be abusing me. If I travel to any country and you call me a nigger, I don't have a problem with it. It's just your opinion. If that's what you want to call me, I'm fine. I'm, I'm cool with it. Why will, I, why will I get worked up? So when your mind is not renewed with the mind of Jesus, you will be processing things wrongly. If I learned that in, in Southern America, maybe in Argentina, so this thumbs up that we do, it's a great offense. But we all do it in many parts of the country to commend somebody, to appreciate somebody. You know, in my part of the country, if you open your five fingers and, and point it to that person, they interpret it to me, you are abusing their mother. How can you imagine? Those are satanic mindset. Those are wrong mindsets that uh, Satan has given unto us. So the fact that somebody call you a black nigger, how is that supposed to make you angry? You know, it's their own opinion. You can call me the way you see me. That's your problem. I know how I see myself, and more importantly, I know who God has created me to be. I'm not defined by you, and I, I'm not going to beg you to define me correctly. No, God has already defined me correctly. I don't need your own definition. So when our mind is renewed, we are able to process information correctly. And when you look at marriage, why, why do people have problems? They process information wrongly. You process people's attitude wrongly. Something may say to the man, how can your wife be sitting down when you just told, him, told her that you are hungry? Is she trying to tell you that, that you should also go to the kitchen and fix a food for yourself? Is that what she's saying? 
and you are claiming to be head of this home, that the man is already processing the attitude wrongly. So it's not only information. We can process people's attitude wrongly. And it doesn't mean people don't mean what they are doing. It is us who must see it in a different perspective. For example, when they were crucifying Jesus, they knew they were crucifying him. They said crucify him, but Jesus said they know not what they are doing. So it doesn't mean that we, we, we say that people don't intend to insult us. They intend to insult you, but you see it differently. That's what we are saying. I know, for example, that if a man is not born again, he is going to be a racist. He is going to be tribalistic. I know that. That deep down, even many who now become born again, they don't have their mind renewed. So they are still tribalistic and racist at heart. Because they are still carnal and they are walking in the flesh. I'm not going to get disappointed if I'm discriminated against. I'm not. I'm not going to get worked up or get angry. Because that is that person's limitation. On the contrary, I should actually pray for that person. So you know now, Jesus said, love your enemies. Because you can only renew your mind with the word of God. So how, how will you not get angry at enemy? You are commanded to love them. He said, do good to them that hate you. Bless them that curse you. And pray for them that despitefully use you. When you have the right mindset, you will be able to process information differently and you will see that you won't be getting angry. Lastly, rest in the Lord. Please don't say, don't be determined in your flesh to say, I won't get angry again. You will keep getting angry. Just rest in this word of God that you have heard. Don't struggle. Let your struggle stop today. You see, God will give you rest. God has already delivered you. You are only to appropriate it and you will see his power in action in your life. You will just discover that things that get you angry no longer get you angry. That's the beginning of your victory. And it will continue like that. Now, I know some people may have a scripture that I've not addressed. Ephesians 4.26. And I want to round up with that. It says, Be ye angry and sin not. Let no sun go down upon your rod. So, with all that I have said, how does this scripture fit in? If we say anger is a sin... Why then will Paul still say, be ye angry and say not? Now, this is what Paul is trying to say that is expressed like this in the scripture. If you want to understand what Paul has said, look at the son of David. Is it Jonadab uh, who, ha- who was in love with Tamar? And the Bible said he loved Tamar. But when we now, with hindsight, when we look at that story, it is actually not love. It was lust. But to him at that Amnon, I think his name is Amnon, yeah. Now, to Amnon, he was in love. He thought to himself that he was in love. So the way the Bible could express it was that he loved Tamar. But we all know that's not love. Love is a conscious, willful decision. To treat somebody the way Christ would treat that person. So we know it's not love, but it's written in the Bible as he loved. Because that's the way we can get a sense of what the scripture is talking about. So when Paul said, be ye angry and sin not, and let not the sun go down upon your rod," Here's what he was trying to say. Paul simply means that, meant to say that, see, people will hurt you and you will get hurt. When they were nailing Jesus to the cross, he felt that pain. Even though he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. You will feel hurt. That's what Paul now said. You can get hurt, but don't sin. People will still do things that will pain you. Whether you like it or not, people will do it. Now, for example, if I'm supposed to get promotion at work and my boss, because he doesn't like my face, now wrote recommendations that denies me from being promoted. It will pain me. It will hurt me. But I know from the scripture that promotion comes not from the west, not from the east, but from the Lord. So I console myself with the fact that this is coming from the Lord. I forgive him. And before that day ends, that matter must end in my heart. It doesn't mean I was not hurt. But I'm able to shake it off and get rid of it. Because if I nurse that hurt, 
That's what will now become this type of anger I just finished discussing and lead to sin. So let nobody deceive you that you will never got, get hurt. You will get hurt. People will do things that will pain you. Jesus felt the pain. Look at Stephen. They were stoning him to death. He was feeling the, the stone in, on his body. They were crushing his core, crushing his bone, his liver, his kidney. Everything were collapsing. But he said, Father, lay not this charge against them. You think Philip didn't feel any pain? He felt pain. But, but, he processed it wrongly, eh, correctly. He knew that they were doing this because they didn't know Jesus. So he said, Father, lay not this charge against them. He followed the word of God to forgive his enemies, to forgive anybody who had offended him. That was the teaching of Christ. So when you also have the teaching of Christ dwelling in you, you will be able to resist anger. You'll be able to walk victorious. That's why the scripture says, let the words of Christ richly dwell in your heart. So you must grow in the word of God. You cannot neglect the word of God and expect to experience the power of God. It is the word of God that brings about the power of God. The Bible said he sent his word and healed them. So you must avail yourself constantly of the word of God. You must be growing constantly, hearing the teachings of the word of God. It will renew your mind. It will empower your spirit and release the virtue of Christ inside of you. And you will see yourself walking victoriously over unrighteousness, over sin, over anger, over evil. My prayer for everyone who has listened to this is that today marks the end of anger, of the issue of anger in your name, in your life, in Jesus' name. I pray that the power of resurrection and the virtue of Christ be released into your life for you to walk victorious over anger in the mighty name of Jesus. Anger will not destroy you in the name of Jesus. Because Jesus has paid for the price on the cross of Calvary, you are set loose and set free from anger in the mighty name of Jesus. Please follow this guide and you will experience the power of God. It can't fail. I was dear myself, but I can testify that indeed I experienced the grace of God and this anger is not a problem to me by the grace of God. So brethren, you also can walk victorious over all of this, over every sin, and it will be so for you in the name of Jesus. My name once again is Olushe Gumoku Olu. Uh, if you are watching this on, the, on our YouTube channel, please remember to subscribe to this YouTube channel and to share this message with Christian brethren, particularly those who may be having challenges in the area of hunger. My number will be in the description below. The number is plus 234-818-615-615. 7852. You can use that number to ask me questions, to share anything with me, to interact with me, or maybe you want uh, this to be further discussed at your meetings and so on. Uh, it will be my honor to, to come around and speak more on it and learn from you and share the word of God together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Until next time, may the Lord keep you in the life of Christ in Jesus' name. Amen.